Great, and uh, please join me in reflecting on the history of the land we're standing on today. This program is being held in the ancestral lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Latgawa peoples and other native peoples. We're grateful to the elders and their people who cared for these lands. And we acknowledge that native people still live here and we honor their sovereignty. We're thankful for these lands and the plants and animals that inhabit them and the water that flows through it. Thank you. So as you can tell from my enthusiastic emails, we think that Ashland's role in addressing climate change is about to come into the spotlight in a big way over the coming months. We've seen what happens when communities try to rein in their dependence on fossil fuels. Take Eugene, for example, which passed an ordinance restricting natural gas and new construction earlier this year. Residents of Eugene have been swamped with a well-funded PR disinformation campaign aimed at distorting the facts about natural gas. So our feeling uh, at the Ashland Collab Climate Collaborative is that we as a community need to be as knowledgeable as possible about the facts and fictions of the movement to 100% electric and get involved in a manner that feels right for each of us. So tonight we're pleased to welcome Jess Grady Benson and Susie Garcia from Road Climate and Brian Soule, Chair of the City of Ashland's Climate Environmental Policy Advisory Committee, uh, which we call affectionately CPAC. Um, and we'll also provide an update on ACC's um, Electrify Ashland Now project. And we have several of our team members here on the call. Um, and Electrify Ashland Now supports Ashland residents in transitioning our existing homes to all electric. But I wanna also say uh, that we have things to celebrate in that uh, this week, the Oregon legislature uh, passed climate legislation uh, against all odds, I think. Um, and I've asked Jess to give us a little bit of a, uh, some information about that as part of her presentation. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, start with um, covering some context before um, we, I turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, so I'm gonna share screen and let's see how that goes. Let's see, here we go. All right, it's working. Love that. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for being here for Electrification in Ashland, the inside scoop. Oh, that's not what I want. I want to go slideshow. There we go. I was doing Zooms every month there for a while, and now I've gotten out of the habit, which is kind of nice. <laughs> have to say. Okay. 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 Uh, so I, I think a lot of you uh, already know this information, but I just want to make sure that we're all starting on the same page when we talk about electrification. Um, so what is it and why do we care about it? So basically it's replacing fossil fuel powered appliances in cars with electricity powered appliances in cars. You know, for many of us meeting our home energy needs with two sources, gas and electric has been the norm. Um, and it is in many parts of the country. Um, and until a few years ago, this wasn't something that we questioned, uh, but that's obviously that's changing. So there's a lot of reasons why we would want um, to convert our homes to 100% electric. Um, for me, as someone who's concerned about climate change, uh, the number one reason for me is that natural gas is methane. It's 70 to 90% methane, which is a, a potent fossil, um, it's a fossil fuel with, um, it's very potent. Um, and studies have shown, infrared cameras have shown that methane is leaking from wellheads through the pipelines and in our homes at a level far greater than previously estimated. Um, and as our, this gas infrastructure ages, leaking will increase. Um, and methane has 86 times the global warming potential of CO2 over 20 years and 28 times over 100 years. Um, and studies have also shown that our gas appliances in our homes are leaking methane, benzene, nitrous dioxide, and other toxic chemicals that reduce indoor air quality and are associated with higher risks of asthma and other respiratory ailments. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, the technologies and economics of electrification have also changed a lot in recent years. Uh, when we first started talking about electrification, everyone would say, oh, but it's so expensive. 
Um, I think, you know, the, the technologies have really changed and the economics. Today's heat pumps and heat pump water heaters offer much better performance and efficiency than the old electric appliances that we had in the past. Um, and this slide is something that we worked with Electrify Now uh, to develop for us. It's based on the um, Ashland utility prices. And basically what it shows us is that you get more warmth in heating with our heat pumps. We get more warmth for the money of useful delivered heat. Um, a typical home needs between 30 and 50 um, MMBTUs um, in a year. And for electric furnace, that would cost $52 per um, MMBTU or these um, annual price, you know, when you add it up using the 30 to 50 range, this is how much it costs per year. So if you look to the far right, you'll see that heat pumps um, are really the, the, the cheapest to operate now based on our current utility prices and um, because they're so efficient. So a lot of these myths are have been shattered by new technology and also with gas prices rising and electro, electricity prices, at least in Ashland right now, uh, being um, very stable, uh, the economics have really changed. So when we talk about what you know, electrifying everything in our home, I love this graphic from Rewiring America, which I think of as one of the leading organizations that provides information and resources about home electrification or electrification in general. Um, so you'll see here all of the all of the things that we mean when we say. Um, electrifying your home. So it means purchasing renewable energy. In Ashton, we're fortunate that uh, 90, you know, 90 plus percent of our energy uh, is hydropower um, because we work with Bonneville Electric, unlike other communities that um, work with investor owned utilities. Um, it means making sure you have um, enough electric service in your home. And then it means converting your heating and cooling to heat pumps, uh, water heater, uh, your, your clothes dryer and your cooking and your vehicles. So a fully, this is a, a, you know, a good example of an all electric home. Now this is a journey for most of us that takes some time to accomplish. Um, but if you think about it as a climate plan that you'll accomplish over a number of years, I think you'll agree that this is attainable. Um, so electrification also, I think it's important to point out, means cleaning up the demand side of our energy usage while state and federal policies work to clean up the supply side. So is our grid completely clean or electricity completely clean in Oregon? No, obviously it isn't. But the good thing is that it is cleaning up. Um, as I said earlier, uh, Ashland's, the carbon intensity of Ashland's electric supply is far cleaner than most. Oregon communities. And in 2021, the Oregon legislature passed landmark legislation, the Clean Energy Targets Bill, HB 2021, which requires the investor owned utilities, which serve 74% of Oregon households, uh, to reduce their emissions associated with electricity sold in Oregon. Um, so by 2030, 2035, 2040, uh, we have uh, significant targets that um, our utilities will be required to meet by switching to renewables. So as consumers, we can clean up our demand for gas um, and uh, dirty fuels while our policy, we push our policymakers uh, to clean up the supply. That's how I look at it. So I'm gonna stop sharing and um, I'm now pleased to introduce our colleagues from Rogue Climate to talk about their work in Ashland to promote an ordinance which would have the effect of reducing Ashland's use of methane. Um, Jess uh, Grady Benson is organizing director at Road Climate. Jess has deep roots in climate justice, racial justice, youth organizing, and leadership development. Susie Garcia serves as Road Valley coordinator for Road Climate. Susie coordinates and organizes teams, projects, and events that grow the climate justice movement in Southern Oregon with emphasis on racial equality and inclusion. Both Susie and Jess work closely with the youth led. Rogue Climate Action Team, or RCAT. We regret that the youth members themselves were unable to join us tonight due to vacation schedules. Jess and Susie will tell us everything we need to know about the campaign. And then we'll be, they'll be followed by Brian Soule, who's chair of our at City of Ashland Climate and Environment Policy Advisory Committee. 
uh, to tell us kind of how what's going on with a proposed ordinance um, in Ashland. And we'll take questions after Jess and Susie and Brian. Um, we'll open up the mics uh, to let you ask your own questions. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what the collaborative is doing with our work uh, in um, with Electrify Ashland now a parallel and complementary movement, as I like to say. So I'm gonna spotlight Jess and Grady, uh, Jess and Susie, and uh, they will be doing a few slides for us. Welcome. Thank you, Lori, for the warm introduction. I'm very happy to be here and um, yeah, the youth has been working so hard all year. They really have been throwing down, showing up, putting in the work, um, sweat and tears, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, so they really um, have earned a well-deserved celebration and um, time off. So they're all kind of on summer mode. Um, we look forward to having them back here in the, in the coming days and plugging right back into the work. Um, so if you can bring us the next slide. Um, you did a wonderful job introducing us, so we'll just go ahead and move along. Time is of the essence. We really respect your time. So for those of you um, new or unfamiliar with Rural Climate, um, I would like to read our mission to you and just uh, familiarize you a little bit about um, uh, with our work. So our mission is to empower Southern Oregon communities most impacted by climate change, including low-income, rural, youth, seniors, and communities of color to win climate justice by organizing for clean energy, sustainable jobs, and a healthy environment. We've worked pretty hard on <laughs> fine tuning this mission. Um, next slide. And Jess is gonna tell us a little bit about the Climate Resilience Package. Great, so thanks so much for having us. It's great to meet you all. Um, Lori asked that we just kick it off to celebrate some of the victories that have happened in the legislative session this year, which was extremely hard won, as I'm sure you all have been following, is a very complicated and challenging session. And the Climate Resilience Package was a huge coalition effort across the state of frontline climate justice and environmental justice organizations, as well as many larger environmental organizations to ensure sure that some key climate action was codified in legislation. And what was won was $61 million for a variety of things. There is so much in this package that I will not get into today because it became a, a combination of multiple bills in, in one, um, in two bills, actually, they got combined together. But some of the highlights are really incentives to access federal funding from the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill at the federal level as well as programs for resilient, efficient buildings, such as a goal of 500,000 heat pumps being installed in Oregon by 2035 and performance standards for commercial buildings. Um, and we're really excited particularly about the $10 million for community resilience hubs grants. That's something that especially our teammate Alessandra really worked very hard on with a coalition of environmental justice organizations across the state to be able to build community-based centers that will support communities in the midst of and in preparing for disaster. Um, and there will also be more funding for community-based renewable energy and green infrastructure, as well as um, other funds that have been created for specific projects. Um, something interesting also is that there will be an advisory committee that will be created to examine opportunities and barriers around renewable energy and transmission siting, which is a huge challenge as we're building out the fossil fuel energy transition to renewable energy. So I know that is a super quick overview, but I want to make sure we get to focus on electrification. So I'll pass it back over to Susie. Thank you, Jess. Um, so the Rural Climate Action Team, also known as RCAP for short. Um, yeah, I try not to use too many acronyms to like actually spell out what all of these um, acronyms are. But yeah, Rural Action, um, team is composed um, currently of um, several Ashland High School students, um, including other youth as well. But um, they have helped to pass the Ashland Climate and Energy Action Plan in um, 2017 um, and have identified natural gas infrastructure as a key area of focus for the next campaign. 
And here's a picture of their, their faces. And here's another picture. This one is, um, uh, they're headed to the Ashton Plaza, the one on the right hand corner. Um, as you can see, they are headed to a rally. So they launched um, the Ashton Youth for Electrification campaign in March of this year. Um, and did a school walkout on, it was March 10th. Uh, and then they walked down to the, they marched down to the um, plaza and had a rally. And we had uh, 400 plus youth um, in, engaged. And there were also some adults there to support. It was a pretty successful event. We were able to gather petition signatures that day. Great. So after the youth launched their official campaign for electrification, which they had been building over the course of years, um, we were able to bring a draft possible ordinance to the city council. And that was then referred to CPAC, which is the Climate and Environment Policy Advisory Committee, of which Brian is a part. And it's been really exciting to be able to engage in that space. Um, and we also have two of our youth members of the Road Climate Action Team who just got officially voted on to that state, that city committee, um, Kiara and Piper. So we're really excited to have youth representation in that space and be working out the details of how to build this policy um, with members of the committee and members of city staff. So on, Ju on June 6th, we had another exciting step forward for the campaign, which is that the Ashland City Council directed city staff based on a recommendation from the Climate and Energy Policy Action Advisory Committee, <laughs> the CPAC, I always call it CPAC, um, to build out a draft electrification policy. And so this was very exciting because it made Ashland the third city in Oregon to commit to transitioning new homes off of fossil fuels and build a policy around that. So the policy itself, um, there is a lot of complexity around what is possible right now with the policy, and I'm happy to get into that more in the q and I know Brian might share about that more as well. Um, but in working with uh, the committee of the city, we've identified multiple policy opportunities with the support of the Green Energy Institute out of Lewis and Clark as well. And the youth campaign, along with Road Climate staff, have decided to really focus in on new residential construction as the focus of this policy, because we see that there is existing technology that makes it really beneficial. It's already something that many affording affordable housing developers are choosing to do, which is build 100% electric right from the bat. Um, and we see there's a lot of positive community support around this particular um, kind of a policy. So what we were advocating for at this moment is for Ashton to pass a policy that's based on an emission standard for new residential construction that would focus on limiting the kinds of pollutants that are created by gas stoves and other fossil fuel um, home appliances to transition new residential construction off of fossil fuels before it's even constructed. Pass it back to you. Thank you. <laughs> so what's next uh, in the campaign? Um, well, a lot, but amidst those things um, include uh, organizing community, um, providing a little bit, like in informing the community as well um, about what this ordinance is asking and what it, it isn't asking. Um, so just providing clarity. Um, we do have an event coming up, uh, but yeah, so engaging community um, and it, uh, engaging stakeholders as well. Um, but if you see this policy timeline, um, we uh, hope to, as you see one, so step one, um, city staff draft an electrification ordinance. Um, and then two would be stakeholder engagement, three would be city council reading um, number one, which we at Rural Climate are hoping it'll happen faster than later, sooner than later. And then for um, city council reading number two, uh, if you move us along to the next slide. Um, yeah, I could tell you a little bit about why electrify new homes in Ashland. So one of them, one reason is health. Um, gas appliances emit harmful air pollutants, including nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter that can cause asthma, heart conditions, hospitalizations, and other health conditions. Um, which also has like an equitable um, or equity component in there because the uh, underrepresented populations and populations who don't have access to healthcare are impacted um, disproportionately. Uh, also an affordability 
uh, point there, it is cheaper to build 100% electric from the start and saves money on utility bills. Um, last but not least, climate justice. This campaign builds off of the city's commitment to reduce greenhouse gases listed in the Ashton Climate and Energy Action Plan that um, youth helped to pass in um, 2017. And needless to say, there's a little alignment with this with the state as a whole to reduce emissions. I think that that's a goal, a bigger part of a bigger goal uh, that we all get to hold together. And next slide. Take action. Um, this is um, a lot of the work that I'm holding is uh, the community organizing piece. So there are three steps. Um, there are three uh, ways that you can take action right now, um, which is to sign the petition. And I'm go, gonna go ahead and um, drop the link, the live link in the chat for you if you're interested in doing that right this minute. Um, I will also include my, my email um, in the chat if you're interested in following up with me directly. Uh, so sign the petition is the best way to get our updates. And then action two would be to attend our July 10th event, um, which is named, um, Ashen Electrification Community Action Gathering. We gave it a really long name, but it's also a fun name. Um, and I will drop the bit.ly the, the bit.ly link in there as well. Thank you, Jess. Um, and so that, yeah, that is one way that you can, um, if you follow the bit.ly link, you can RCP to the event, get more event details, also stay looped in uh, with updates on our work. And then the third action would be to volunteer. Um, we are holding down a text bank beginning tomorrow, uh, 530 to 730, um, to invite community to attend the event. If you are interested in learning a little bit more about the event, feel free to reach out to me. I don't know that we have time to, to delve too deeply, but I could tell you that it'll be a part presentation. Um, there will be opportunities for uh, group breakouts uh, for community to have conversation amidst themselves as well. And we wanted to be really interactive and informative and there will be a Q&A where we will address uh, questions from the community or any concerns or um, if community members need clarity around um, the work that we're doing and next steps moving forward. Um, so if you wanna help out by text banking um, or phone banking, which is happening the day after 4th of July, hopefully people won't be too tired <laughs> from celebrating, um, but we will be calling um, community members um, that day. And then last but not least, volunteer for a role at the actual event. So I have a few roles um, to help out um, Monday, July 10th. Um, the event will happen in Ashland, um, tentatively at the Trinity Episcopal Church. Um, Submitted an application, waiting for confirmation, but it's looking like that's where we're gonna hold it. And I will also include my email in the chat if you have any questions or would like to follow up. And I think that's it. If, if you are unfamiliar with how to reach our organization as a whole, um, that is where our office is. We're right next to Charm, the restaurant in Phoenix. Um, it's become quite popular. Um, and our office phone number, our website, and our um, organization email if you need to get a hold of us. You also have Instagram and Facebook. And thank you for listening to our presentation. You are muted, Lori. There I go. Thank you, Jess and Susie. That was really great. Um, and I'm sure people have lots of questions, um, but we're going to turn it over to Brian um, Soul. And so I'm going to unpin you um, for now. And other people have whole crews of, of, of help on stuff like this, but I just have myself. That's OK. So let's see, we're gonna add a spotlight for Brian and we're gonna take Jess off the big screen and uh, Brian, if you wanna say a few words while I um, just get the slides up. Sure, thanks, Lori, and uh, great presentation, Susie and Jess. Uh, Road Climate's been extremely helpful in helping to organize the youth who brought the ordin ordinance to city council who then passed it on to the CPAC. Um, I'm the chair of the Ashland Climate and Environment Policy Advisory uh, Committee. And in 2015, I was appointed by Mayor Stromberg at the time to be on the ad hoc committee that developed 
the Ashland Climate and Energy Plan. Um, so I've been working on this type of stuff for a while. I'm by no means an expert, but I'm a committed volunteer. And um, I gave a presentation along with um, one of our students, Kiera, who's on the CPAC committee on June 6th to City Council. I'm going to present those same slides and talk a bit about that, and then I'd be happy to entertain some questions. So, Laura, if you could give me my first slide. So, um, the climate and energy plan for Ashland was worked on between 2015 and 2017. I looked back on my calendar, and I think I attended 36 meetings. A key I think is that youth were very involved in that process. Two of the ad hoc members were in fact Ashland High School students. Um, and the city council was packed on multiple city council meetings when the climate plan adoption was discussed. Um, students just packed um, the council chambers and gave very important testimony that led to in March of 2017, the SEEP Climate and Energy Plan being passed unanimously. And for the community, there's both goals for the community and city um, structures and city operations. But for the community, there's a goal to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions here in Ashland 8% per year on average every year to 2015. Um, and clearly, we're not doing that. Um, if we look worldwide, when we started that uh, process of developing the climate and energy plan at the uh, observatory at the top of the volcano in Hawaii, where they measure parts per million of carbon dioxide, it was big news because in early 2015, the uh, number had just passed 400 parts per million. And just last month, uh, May is the highest level each year in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and the number is now up to 424. So clearly worldwide, we're not making the progress uh, we need to. Um, one of the other things that's really important, I think about the climate and energy plan um, that's important is that there are three overriding kind of commandments of the climate and energy plan. One is that uh, city council consider climate change in all of the council's policies, budgeting, or legislative decisions. Two, that um, departments in the city are required to educate their staff on the climate and energy plan. And three, that all committees and commissions consider climate in the scope of all of their uh, appropriate decisions that they are to make. So um, I'm talking to the Planning Commission tonight and I'm gonna remind them of that duty. Um, next slide, Lori. So in Ashland, as well as worldwide, we're not doing well. If we look at just our natural gas, natural in quotes, um, our consumption from 2015 to 2020 has gone up 2000 and gas meters have gone up about 5% um, in the last five years, both residential uh, and commercial. So we're going in the wrong direction in terms of our fossil fuel use, um, at least where meters are hooked up. Next slide. Um, so as touched upon by Lori and the road climate team, natural gas um, is primarily methane. It's a much more potent heat uh, trapping gas than carbon dioxide. Um, and it's really not natural, but it's important that we reduce its use if we're to begin to meet our SEEP climate and energy plan goals and to reduce our community greenhouse emissions. And there are health risks to using uh, methane in our homes. Uh, next slide. Um, Last uh, year, the American Lung Association published a review on the use of um, in uh, the in July of 2022, the American Lung Association published a literature review on the impacts of 
residential combustion. And what they found linked to methane use was a 40% increased risk of childhood asthma in terms of exacerbations and wheezing and up to a 24% increased risk of new asthma in children. There's also a suggestion of other um, risk of health, uh, uh, detrimental health effects from indoor use of uh, fossil fuels. Um, and that would include uh, other gases such as benzenes and uh, nitrous oxides. Um, and there could be an increased risk of cancers and developmental delays and maternal uh, child health effects during pregnancies. But those are harder to prove and the associations aren't as strong, but the asthma uh, association is very clear. Um, next slide, please. So the Rogue Action Team, uh, the uh, high school students working with Rogue Climate brought an ordinance to city council back in March. And this ordinance was based upon the Eugene ordinance and the Eugene ordinance was for new, um, no new infrastructure related to fossil fuel in new residential construction in buildings three stories or less. The Rogue Climate Action Team, the Ashland Youth, uh, initially were interested in an ordinance that included new residential, commercial, and industrial, but they've since scaled that back to just be new residential. The Eugene ordinance was in fact based upon an ordinance in Berkeley. And recently, about a little over a month ago, the US Ninth, US Ninth District Court ruled that the Berkeley ordinance was not in compliance with federal statute. In Berkeley, a group of restaurant owners and cooks brought suit um, and were supported by the court decision. Their argument was that they weren't trained to cook on induction stoves. Um, and so it's a little bit unclear what the overall reach of that decision is. Um, Berkeley has appealed that decision and is hoping that the full Ninth District Court will review the case. The ruling was uh, released only as an opinion from three of the judges, not the full court. If the full court agrees to review that case, the decision would be stayed until a final decision is made. So currently, um, the RCAT proposal for an ordinance is a new ordinance to include new residential construction only, and they're hoping for a resolution that would further study options regarding uh, fossil fuel use in commercial, industrial, and large remodels or substantial remodels. Um, next slide. Lori, thanks. So the RCAT and CPAC um, have identified three alternative options for an ordinance applying to new residential construction. One is a strategy based on limiting toxic emissions indoors. And that is the legal strategy behind a ban on new natural gas infrastructure that's been placed into law by New York City and very recently by the state of New York. Um, that is currently, the, I think, the favored approach um, by the RCAT team, the Rogue Climate Action Team youth. Um, another possibility would be for Ashland to have a local amendment to the state building code. These are very difficult to put in place. Ashland would have to show a unique need as to why their building code should be different than the rest of the state. Um, the, these are occasionally granted by the commissioner of the state buildings. It's not a board that makes a decision. It's one person, but um, it can be very difficult and lengthy regarding time to get a, a local amendment through. Another option would be to apply restrictions and new rights of way. So say, for instance, Ashen wanted to have a new development, perhaps the Crowman Park area out towards um, the old mill behind Bellevue School, um, you could apply restrictions and new rights of way so that if you put in a new road, you couldn't accompany that with new piping. 
this uh, would not apply to say, for instance, if you had a vacant lot in an otherwise filled neighborhood where there's existing pipelines. Um, so there's pros and cons of each way. The new right of way also would have to be drafted in consideration of the agreement um, that the city currently has with Avista. Um, so at the June 6, next slide, um, uh, city council meeting, um, the Rogue Climate Action Team and the CPAC came to city council with a specific ask, and that was directly for them to direct the city manager um, to free up the people power, the hours for city staff and the city attorney to draft an ordinance, um, which will then be brought back to the CPAC for further consideration and will start a very um, detailed stakeholder engagement process um, where we can hear from the citizenry of Ashland, from various stakeholders such as Avista, builders, restaurants, et cetera, uh, what they would feel about this. Um, I had a very interesting phone conversation today with the mayor of Eugene about the stakeholder process in Eugene. Um, what's happened in Eugene is Eugene uh, in February passed an ordinance uh, banning new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure and new residential and then Northwest Natural Gas led a very um, extensive and expensive campaign to gather signatures to challenge the ordinance and it is scheduled to be on the November ballot um, to be voted on by the citizenry of Eugene. Um, and I think some of her suggestions we have to take to heart and uh, draft our ordinance correctly the first time and not uh, go through the process that Eugene's having to go through. And um, so anyway, that's uh, my presentation. Um, I, I want to stress that um, this ordinance uh, has been brought to the city council by the youth of Ashland. Um, they're very, very concerned about their future. I think our generation um, owes it to our youth to do everything we can to maximize their future. And I look forward to continuing to work with members of the CPAC and the Road Climate Action Team, the Ashland Climate Collaborative and interested citizens to get an ordinance on the books. Um, I think this is, uh, especially as it relates to explicitly new residential is low hanging fruit and shouldn't be that controversial. Um, we have a lot of work to do if we're going to meet our climate goals that the Ashland Climate Plan has set out. And this is a really a first step, a small step, but an important step um, to get the ball rolling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm going to bring um, Susie and Jess back in, and, and we'd like to take some questions now. Um, so here we go. And it would help me if if uh, people could raise their hands if they'd like to ask a question. We could do. We usually do questions in the chat, but I think it's important to hear each other's voices. So I'm going to. I'm going to try it that way. So any questions for Susie, Brian, or Jess? Can I just answer one of them in the chat? First? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, the process of getting an ordinance into law requires uh, two readings by city council. And Regina Ayers asked um, if the first reading has been scheduled yet by the council, it has not. So um, the process where we are right now is literally that city staff and city um, attorney are just starting to work on putting together an ordinance and they will look at the pros and cons of the emissions-based strategy, of the rights of way, maybe a fee structure, different types of things to come up with what they think is best. 
that will then come back to the CPAC where we will look at it. And then there will be an extensive stakeholder process. Um, Row Climate in July has a um, informational uh, meeting that they're going to hold. And then the CPAC will have public hearings. You're always invited to come to the CPAC meeting. There's specific time for public comment, um, but there will be a stakeholder engagement process. So in terms of when the first and second ordinances will be happening, I, you know, I, I think we're probably looking towards August, September at the earliest. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Sorry, I just jumped in. <laughs> no, that's what you should do, Susie. <laughs> There's another question. Uh, it's kind of related, which is why I jumped in. Um, but there's a question in the chat about who are the stakeholders. Uh, so it's a little related um, to what Brian is talking about. Um, and I, I'll take a stab, but it's it's a collaborative effort, really, is what it is. So um, Jess and Brian, please feel free to like fill in the gaps that I leave behind. Um, but it's we're compiling a list of um, uh, basically uh, like individuals and um, businesses who would be impacted by this ordinance. Um, and like, for example, um, contractors whose uh, livelihood is like building houses, for example. Um, so I'll pass it on to Justin, right? If you wanna fill in um, some of those gaps. Yeah, I, I think it, thanks Susie. It could, you know, would involve people, businesses like Litweiler Simonson that do cre cremation. It could involve, uh, the restaurants that use gas to make pizzas, et cetera. Uh, interestingly, today um, I was looking at uh, restaurants that use induction cooking, and it's becoming more and more the practice, in fact, the favored practice of many chefs, especially in Paris. There's Michelin starred restaurants in France that are using only induction uh, cooking. Um, People are very, very used to natural gas, but I think um, there's a lot of benefits, including uh, health benefits from using induction stove. Um, so those would be the types of, of people that would be involved. Um, we'd love uh, to hear from some of the larger uh, business hold, holders of the rental, large amounts of rental units um, in town, as that would impact um, a lot of the lower income people in town. So um, I don't think that it's possible prospectively for us to identify all the stakeholders, um, but definitely there will be open sessions where anybody who considers themselves to be a stakeholder will be invited to give testimony and ask questions. Great. And I'll just add to that briefly that because we are focusing right now on residential new construction, we'll be focusing first on home builders, affordable housing developers, housing justice organizations, but that piece about the resolution down the line to commit to the commercial and industrial transition as well will be probably a much more in-depth stakeholder engagement process because it has been more contentious in other places and the technology is a bit more emergent for um, larger commercial industrial businesses. And one thing I think that's going to be a real important question that people are going to ask is the cost. And um, I really want to thank um, Lori for showing that slide of cost per BTU from different uh, housing or different heating options. And uh, one thing that's very encouraging to me is that the Jackson County Housing Authority, which has been responsible for putting in a lot of low income housing units in Ashland and throughout the Rogue Valley in the last few years, especially uh, since the Alameda, Alameda fire has exclusively been using electricity and they're doing that on a cost basis. That's the most cost efficient, let alone you know even the climate considerations and health considerations. Right. Okay, we have one more question and then um, I, I'll be doing my wrap up slides. Um, how will citizens hear about the proposed ordinance and public input opportunities? Um, how do you think that word will get out? 
I'd like to speak for um, for Rural Climate and RCAT and discussion, and I think that um, Deepak may have a, a something to add, possibly. Uh, but I'll speak for Rural Climate. Um, I, I want to welcome everybody here and and really community members tell your friends tell your neighbors tell your family um feel comfortable letting um rural climate staff know your your level of interest and involvement and engagement if you're like i want to hear the general uh key points but please don't add me to your this and that and that and that list like if you're like i don't want to get phone calls but i want to get texts or i want to get your general emails but i don't want to get 500 emails just please let us know your level of engagement like what you would like um, to hear feel free to email me with those specifications you can drop them in the chat i'll take notes um we want to make sure that you stay as engaged as you would like to be um but that we're not overwhelming you if if, if that's not your cup of tea so please let us know um we would be happy to add you to our newsletter to our our group um uh, communications groups um, and provide with with you as provide you with as much information as you would like to have. And also, if you do decide to become part of our newsletter, um, we would happily invite you to our events um, and keep you engaged. And, and we're certainly going to do our best to um, publicize anything. Um, we don't we don't blast out um, constantly, but uh, when we know something's coming up. Uh, we'll go ahead and share that with, with our readers. So I want to take just a few minutes to talk about Electrify Ashland Now and what we do, uh, which is, as I said, parallel and complementary to, um, to the work that we've been talking about tonight. Um, so just a couple slides. So um, the Ashton Climate Collaborative has a project. Oops, wait for it to come up. Of uh, called Electrify Ashland now, uh, an all volunteer team, wonderful people. We've been working on this for about two years, um, and and we've been focused on helping existing homeowners to, um, or yeah, to, uh, homeowners, residents, apartments to um, go to all electric um, in our existing homes. And the reason why um, I pulled these stats from the, our recent housing capacity analysis that was done for the city of Ashland is, you know, we have 11,000 current dwelling units in Ashland. Uh, we project about 8% growth in the next 20 years. That's not very many homes. Uh, the average lifespan of a gas furnace is 15 to 20 years. And the average lifespan of a gas hot water heater is eight to 12 years. So you could see that, um, uh, Ordinances that uh, that uh, address new construction have an important role to play in uh, reducing our natural gas usage, uh, but we also have um, do need to deal with the existing our existing building stock. So Electrify Asha now, um, what we work on is helping to establish public rejection of natural gas as a social norm, helping residents electrify by providing information on the incentive programs that are available, uh, um, navigation and technical assistance uh, to help you on your journey to all electric. Um, and our goal specifically is that we will help reduce res residential methane usage by 10% um, uh, uh, by 2025 compared to 2020s, which you know is actually quite ambitious. Um, so uh, if you wanted to take the, we think the, the big four steps to start with to lower your emissions in your own home are uh, learn about the rebates and tax credits available. Uh, schedule a free energy assessment is a good way, place to start. The city will provide it for free. Um, and you might decide that you wanna go further than what the city provides, but that service is available to you. Um, plan your projects. When you know the age of your equipment, you could replace older models on your schedule. So the idea is not, we know that everybody, uh, most people cannot just go out and replace their equipment just like that. So the idea is to know the age of your equipment and when it is like, you wanna replace it before it dies and you wanna plan to, um, to do that uh, before you're in trouble, like where you need a heater or you need a hot water heater right away. Um, we also are putting an intake form on our homepage of electrifyashland.org to help you connect with a trained neighbor who will help you refine your plan. So the resources we have, we have lots of stuff on our, web, our website. 
We do in-person meetups where we do a lot of uh, personal hand-holding. We do individual consultation by email or phone or home visit. Um, and we're available to come to your church or social club or neighborhood uh, to do presentations um, to um, help us all on our climate plan and our journey um, to all electric. Um, so um, one of the other pieces of our strategic plan, as I said, we're, you know, I mentioned these first two, but on the right hand side, an important part for us is proactively collaborating with other Oregon communities working on electrification initiatives. Um, so I'm really excited about this um, new development. Um, we, you know, as I said, we've been working on um, voluntary electrification for about two years in Ashland. We were actually the very first community in Ashland to start, to, in Oregon to start such a program. And, um, and we do know that in many states, um, there are starting to be organizations that are working on this, uh, but we kind of see ourselves as uh, kind of leaders on this. Um, and since we uh, I, we developed Electrify Ashland, um, now a number of other communities have followed suit. And we met recently to talk about developing a statewide network that would um, bring us all together to do this work. Um, so, we're uh, the, the the placeholder name right now is Electrify Oregon. We might end up having a different name, uh, but it's a network of community-based organizations working to electrify homes, buildings, and transportation throughout Oregon. Um, so it's really you know community-based and working um, you know with existing um, our existing community. So this is going to give us a lot of extra juice. Um, to uh, broaden this effort and do a quality job. I'm really impressed with the people that are working on this. Um, it's certainly gonna help electrify Ashland a lot and allow other communities to move quickly. We've learned a lot of lessons over the last two years of helping homeowners uh, on this journey to electrification. And we're eager to share that. Um, and this is going to be a platform uh, that allows a lot of sharing between Oregon communities. And we're also talking to communities in other states. So um, this is really building up very quickly. Uh, so you will see these are some of the other organizations that are participating in this coalition. Um, so we were the first, I have to say that I'm proud of us. Um, and there's a lot of folks that are, uh, that we're working with at this point. Um, I thought I had a slide about the Inflation Reduction Act, and I apparently don't uh, don't have that, so I'm going to stop sharing. But um, let's see. Uh, I, um, as you know, the Inflation Reduction Act um, incentives um, will become available. The tax credits are now available, and we encourage people to um, go to Rewiring America, where you will find a calculator that will allow you to, to check out um, what incentives are available to you. Um, so it, for those of us who have already live in a home, already own a furnace, already have a hot water heater and a stove, um, you know, when you're ready to, to start making your plan to go all electric, and I hope you'll do that, um, we're here to help you. So I, that concludes my remarks for the evening. Um, I'd like to see whether we have any more questions. To follow up with us, um, you can um, email us at info at ashlandclimate.org or go to our electrifyashland.org website. Uh, you reach out into a number of ways. Um, okay, so are there any, I'm gonna, see our participants and see if anyone else we have any final questions. I hope this answers your, uh, your, your curiosity about why we felt so strongly uh, that the climate activists of this community and people who already understand this challenge um, are, are well versed in what is actually going on and able to play a role if you feel uh, inclined to support this work and um, or answer questions about what is electrification or are we gonna break the grid or um, you know how is this gonna work? Uh, would anyone else from the Electrify Ashland Now uh, team like to chime in with any additional thoughts? I see a couple of you out there. Laurie, I'll say uh, 
I think as part of feedback from the stakeholders, part of our role will increase to help educate people in responses to their questions. So this will be a learning journey for all of us to get on the same page why this ordinance is so important. Yeah, and I think what we've seen in other communities around the country, not just Eugene, is that there was there have been massive disinformation campaigns. Or you know, uh, you will hear things like they're trying they're going to come and take away your gas stove. So I think you've heard tonight that that's not what's happening. Um, but you know, we are on the path to reduce our emissions as our city committed to uh, with the Climate and Energy Action Plan, uh, and I'm excited about that. So I hope you'll all be. Um, be able to uh, help uh, talk to your neighbors about this as this unfolds in the few next coming months and uh, and be a source of information uh, and resources in the community. Any final comments uh, from Brian, Susie, or Jess? Come to our event July 10th. <laughs> July 10th. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you all so much for, for having us. Thank you all for attending today and inviting us. Thank you so much. This was great. Now I feel like we've got the inside scoop now. Uh, we really appreciate the work we're, you're doing, and I know you'll you'll let us know uh, when we can help and how how we all can help. So thank Absolutely. you so much for your work. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you all so much. Take care. Okay. Bye.